So I, want, I will talk about uh, breaking code today and getting cheating in contract breed. Uh, about us, Rezo is uh, leading some sort of uh, company for doing trading on the stock exchange. Uh, Amir is an accountant who works for, let's say, one of the big four companies in accounting in the world. And I'm a researcher in the field of trusted computing and virtualization in the College of Management in Israel and in the University of Ivaskula in Finland. I lead truly protect startup in the trusted computing field. And I'm also Breed's life master. Amir, by the way, was a European champion in Breed's 2003. So everything we describe is something that interested us to study. We are not really crypto geeks. This is all basically hobby work. Now, about today's talk, uh, we will talk about the scientific aspect of breaking codes and some real life example. Um, this is really about some top players, like best players in the world, uh, being found sitting in breed in 2015. We focused about two Israelis. Uh, Mr. Ron Schwartz and Mr. Rutan Fischer. We focused about the Israelis because we, were, we are Israelis. We were actually sitting in front of the computer rooting for the local team to win. And we actually tried to protect them even when the accusation arrived. And then we found out, uh, we tried to protect them and we found out that they were really sitting, but not in the way people thought that they were sitting. So that's what we describe. And uh, we will present uh, our findings and also other people's findings. Uh, whatever was not found by us, we will uh, basically say. Uh, if we sin further than others, that's because we stood on giant shoulders and we were able to actually see further. Uh, we basically comment mostly about the Israeli Brits Federation talks, which are available online. We, we are not invited to the American contract bridge hearings or the European bridge league, uh, European bridge league hearings, and these are not available online. But we know more or less what happened from rumors. So, first of all, uh, why would somebody sit in bridge? I mean, that sounds like a game that like four old ladies play in the kitchen, and doesn't sound like something that you'll make a lot of money. So apparently. First of all, bridge is not a spectator sport. Nobody will pay to watch bridge like people are paying to watch football or basketball or boxing. People are not paying to watch bridge. However, uh, people actually will pay money to professionals to play with them or to play in a team with them. And as a result, there are professional bridge players making significant amounts of money, let's say between 200,000 to half a million dollar a year, which perhaps not compete with Cristiano Ronaldo, but it's enough money that somebody would want to, to, com to compete for, to play for. And on the plus side, the career of a bridge player begins, let's say, semi-professionally at the age of 14, let's say some play professionally at the age of 18, and it can go on for 35 to 45 years on average. Some play professionally even when they are 90 years old, 89 years old. So it's pretty long career, and it's a pretty high paycheck. There is motivation to actually cheat. It's not just something that you would cheat for fun. Okay, so... I'm trying to talk as much as I can about breed without actually teaching breed. <laughs> so breed is a game that played between two pairs, north, south, and east, west. There is nothing special about the direction. It's just the names. Like I can play north, south in one board, and on the next round I'll be east, west. There is nothing special about it, and you can actually rotate the board. In a team's game, four players plays against four players. One uh, team sends a north-south pair to play against the east-west pair of the other uh, team. The other team sends uh, 
North South pair, East West pair to play against sorry North South pair to play against the East West pair of the first team. Now, in a normal uh, game of breed, uh, you play with identical cards to minimize the element of luck. So m our North South plays the same cards as their North South. Our East West plays the same cards as their East West, and the cards are held on something like that called the board. Each round, you pull the cards from the board, and you, you see your cards. After you end the round, you return the cards to the board, and they are playing identical same cards on the other table. Now, a board usually takes about seven or eight minutes to play. A short competition takes about 24 boards, or about three hours. And let's say World Championship takes about takes hundreds of boards and several days. If you play every single board in a world championship and you reach the final, then you play something like 800 or 900 boards. Now, the last thing is that in breeds, uh, everything that you play, every card that you play, everything that you, that you do is uh, going to encode some meaning describing your hand to your partner. For example, a high card followed by a low card may indicate that you have an even or odd number of cards in that suit, that you favor an higher ranking suit or a lower ranking suit, that you like the lead or you don't like the lead. Everything basically is encoded there. And this encoding is not cryptographic, which means uh, the other party, if I'm north-south, east-west, is entitled to know uh, all my encoding methods, or everything that I, uh, everything systematically that we do, the other party is entitled to know. There is full disclosure. And in the last, the last thing is that in breed, like in many other sports, most of the times where you actually lose points, you screw yourself. Most of the acts that actually cost you point or win point to the other teams are self-inflicted. You try to guess what cards uh, happen to be dealt right now to partner based on the bidding, based on the play of the card until that point. Sometimes you'll get it right, sometimes you'll get it wrong. Usually good players will get it right more often than bad players. So. On a single round, there is, let's say, 50 plus some epsilon chance for the better team to win. If you play significant amount of rounds, then eventually the, the better team is vast favorite to win. I mean, let's think about the casino here. Sometimes the casino pays the gambler, but the casino in the long run is usually vastly favorable to win. So that's all about bridge. I'm not going to talk about bridge anymore. And, sorry, there are basically two types of cheating. The first type of cheating, which is also the most common, and it's the one that I'm going to focus on, is conveying information that illegally not through gay means. Gay means means that, for example, you cannot convey information by making faces, making sounds, I don't know, pulling your tongue, scratching your head. That's basically illegal to convey information in that matter. You can only convey information using the card that you play or the beats that you make. The second type of information of uh, cheating, which is rarer and I'm not going to deal with, but it also exists, is reporting results that on a match that never happened. Uh, let's say I pay you to say that I won or something, uh, following the dealing of the cards, following the replication of the cards, following the board, uh, illegally looking at your opponent card, uh, trying to play a card that was already played, using illegal substances, I don't know. All that stuff is considered illegal, but it's done much less often than the first one, which is, by the way, not very often at all. I mean. In the world class level, bridge is being played for about 80 years, and there were, let's say, less than 50 cases of cheating, less than 20 cases or 30 cases of actually conveying illegal information. So, first of all, to prevent conveying information, even accidentally, 
you don't really speak when you play bridge. You may see it in the newspaper, like North opened one spade or one club, and, oh, sorry. What it means is that North pulls like something like that from a bidding box and places it on the table. So there is no like forceful one club, what loud one club, hesitating double, forceful double. That's basically all gone from the real game of breeds. Uh, information is not supposed to transfer and oral bidding is really rare unless it's really like an amateur's game. Of. Now, in professional games, they used to play with those boards. Then, in uh, 1965, two, two British players were found to convey information by the way they held their cards. Uh, like, if you held it in a certain way, to convey some information about the distribution of hearts that you have in, in your hands. And as a result, in tournament play, in professional games, there is like a screen that goes uh, diagonally over the table. And east doesn't see west, north doesn't see south. You don't see your partner, so you can't convey legal information. Now, as we will see in a second, screens did not prevent illegal information passage, but they actually made it more difficult to transfer information. So, as I said, there is a screen that goes from northwest to southeast. Basically, south and west see each other, or north and east see each other, but the pair, the, every player doesn't see his partner, and as a result, you cannot convey information, and you cannot transfer information to your partner illegally. Now, that did not prevent seating. Um, as we will, as it occurred in 1975, players were caught, two Italian players were caught tapping each other's foot under the screen, which led to first small tea tables to be placed under the tables. And then the, that led to screens to go actually under the tables. And in uh, 2013, uh, Coing and other sounds were actually found to, to pass the screens, which I will soon demonstrate. And all that happened before the main events actually occurred. Okay, so that basically demonstrates, sorry, how British is Oh, oh, wait. Sorry. For some reason. Okay. Fine, let's do it like that. That basically demonstrates how Braid is played in a tournament play. Basically, there is the screen. There is the bid, and there is like a tray with the player's passes and they transfer the bid. When the play is basically over, people collect their bid, remove the tray, put the board on the table, open a small shutter in the screen so they can see, they can see each other play, and they basically play. No. Sorry. Sorry. Wait, 
leads us to the event that happened in 2013. These are basically two German players that were actually caught cheating. And here is one thing that they did. You see, already seen his card. He's now placing the tray, and he makes like a, a short hand movement that actually says, I don't have anything in my hand. And that's illegal passing of information to his partner. And that was actually found long before we, we approached the field. Another thing that they did, if you see, is actually coin. And that indicates that he has short spades in his hand. He has only one spade in his hand. In, in his hand. And here again, he's going to call just once to show that he has only one club in his hand. So that was actually. That's actually demonstrate how breed professionally is being played. By the way, those two Germans that were caught sitting were also the world champions for seniors, that is for players above 60 or something. And uh, they actually they actually been caught red-ended and removed from play for basically life. Now we go back to our story. Uh, that's Boye Brugland, he's the hero of our story. He is a British professional. He holds the World Championship for 2007. And after the event that I will describe, he won the 2015 Personality of the Year Award. Those are the two cheaters that we basically helped to uncover, uh, Lutan Fischer and Ron Schwartz. And in 2014 and 2015, they basically won everything that you can win. They won the World Championship, the transnational teams. They won the European Championship with Israel. They won three different uh, North American Championship. When we caught them, it was like catching Lance Armstrong cheating. At the time, they were one of very few pairs that were considered like really in the world top, in a very short list of pairs. And that guy, he's not a professional breed player or anything. But for him, it was important for us to have those videos. He actually started taping videos and allowed cheaters to be uncovered. And he put all the videos online of tournament plays in Europe. And if it weren't for him, catching for, of cheaters would have been impossible. And as we will soon discover, most of European top pairs uh, were cheating at a time. So what happened, or sorry, se several top European pairs were sitting at a time. So what happened in, on 2015 North American Breed Championship? So Boye and his team were playing against their ex-teammates, uh, Lutan Fischer and Ron Zwart. They were actually teammates before the play. And Ron and Lutan took a series of, let's say, ethical or breed questionable decisions that led Boye to suspect that they were sitting. Boya created a website, breedsitters.com. By the way, it's still online if you want, you can check. And got sued for $1 million in, like, for Slayer. And uh, Boya called for basically crowdsourcing people to watch the, the breed games be between uh, Fischer, Zwart, and their opponents and try to find the code that they were using to cheat. A Swedish player, Per Ula Kulin, uh, breaks. We will see what breaks means, but he supposedly broken the code. The code, as he described it, was uh, when they are sitting north-south and they are pushing the, the, the board, they will put the board on a certain position depending on which shoot they want led. For example, if I want a uh, Spay to be led, I will push it towards partner. If I want club to be led, I will push the board towards me. If I want diamonds to be led, I put it in the middle. If I want heart to be led, I put it on the side. And if there is no preference, 
then I'll just put a board somewhere and no, not remove it until partner leads. That's basically the sign for no preference. So, That's breedcitrus.com, that's the website, and that's basically the accusation against them. Basically, in all those cases, they put the board in the center, and that's where they are actually declaring the hand. Now, when they are defending the, the, the hand, they are taking the board and put it somewhere according to a signal. So, sorry. Sorry. That, that's basically all the normal position. Now you see actually pushes the board to a position that's not normal. See, push putting it on the side, and that's actually a case for an art signal, again, a case for the heart signal, again, a case for the heart signal. Th that's basically the irregular uh, signaling here again for the spade signal. That's basically the irregularity. And here is the code. So when he pushes it all the way through, that's a signal for spade. When he places it on the side, that's a signal for heart. And when he places it on the middle, that's a signal for diamond. When he keeps it in his side of the board, that's a signal for club. That's how it looks like when, when I'm supposed to lead. So he pushes it all the way for a spade, and Svart leads a spade. He, he makes the unnatural move of placing that in the side after it was actually in the middle, and that's called for a heart. And he places it exactly in the middle, and Zwart leads diamonds. So somebody looked at this. Yeah. We looked at something like 40 or 50 hours of videos uh, trying to write everything that happened. And those Perola Colin and the Swedish guys, they did the same. We looked, we scattered counting, like times he touches the share, times that he called, times that, that's like 40 or 50 hours of probably the most boring show in the world, but and making lots of uh, observation. So, Kit will see another world champion. Oh, sorry. Kit will see another world champion. Has actually wrote an article in breedswinners.com, that's the most popular breeds forum, about the events. He basically convinces the, most of the world that they are cheating. And uh, what happens now? So first of all, Ron and Lutan are, exp are uh, banned from playing by the Israeli Bridge Federation, by the European Bridge League, and by the American Contract Bridge League. So they cannot, uh, they cannot play. The three organizations independently charges them of ethical misconduct. And uh, 
Israel resigns from the World Breed Championship, Sweden takes its place, and the world moves on and try, finds three other titles that we never discussed. The world number one and number two players, Flavio Fantoni and Claudio Nunes, are found cheating and delivering information. By the way, they play the cards if it's played diagonally or horizontally on the board, and they are banned from play. And Monaco resigns from the World uh, Breed Championship. Uh, Smirnov and Pierre, like, uh, two another German players, not the ones from the videos at first, but another pair is also found sitting. They admit and they are judged by the European Bridge League and by the German Bridge Federation. And Adam Zbudzinski and Cesar Ibalitsky, two Polish players, are, let's say, banned from play, suspected of cheating. And Poland does not resign from the World Championship and also wins the World Championship with two other players, not with Balitski Zbudzinski. And we are not happy. Now, why are we unhappy? So, um, we are unhappy with the scientific method. We think that it might have been affected by prejudice against the pair, that people didn't like the pair. There is no fresh data. People looked at boards as they were already played and developed a method based on the board that were already played. The sample size it was actually limited to some international event, to the European Bridge Championship, which we found too small. And we had, th there were only 11 suspected boards of cheating, and out of them we had two significant outliers that we thought, okay, that's impossible. Like a pair in that level, world champions, they might get one wrong, but two out of 11 is basically too, too much. And when all this started, at least two of us were defending the pair, getting lots of abuse in bridge forums, trying to prove that the scientific method that declared them cheaters was insufficient. Um, Re Rezo actually defended them online and actually gave a, a speech and testimony in the Israeli Bridge Federation. Uh, I questioned the research method online. Amir uh, was the only one that was convinced that they were cheating, but still was unhappy with the result. And we all had to explain, like, why Svart's movement looks so unnatural. I mean, let's say they are not cheating. Why do they make all those weird movements and unnatural movements uh, to cheat? With respect to pre -judice, I would say that Fischer and Svart were involved in cheating in, as juniors. And uh, they are far from being the nicest players in the world. They are obnoxious, they are show-offs, and it's very possible that players wanted to put them out of the way. I mean, they are proud and annoying. Fresh boards. So, oh, and by the way, several boards that were inconclusive mysteriously changed their marking over like the internet to feed accusation against them better, which was again, Weird. Uh, fresh boards. So uh, the same boards were used to raise the hypothesis and to actually judge they are guilty. And that doesn't work that way because bridge is played by human beings. Human beings call. Human beings need to go to the bathroom. Human beings make some noises. Human beings place the boards not so very accurately at the table. And if there was no separation and was no prediction, you can just say that, OK, you, you did a Texas Sharp shooter and you draw the, you, you, you draw the mark around where you actually hit, which is not something that is scientifically possible. Uh, how do one supposed to deal with uh, uh, no fresh data? So, first of all, there were more data. There was data from the Polish uh, Premier League for breed, which Fischer and Zwarts played as like uh, sponsored players. There were data from uh, other tournaments that they played, and. Somebody actually 
uh, suggested to use the data as well. Also, there was data from board that they were playing east-west. Now, when they are playing east-west, they are not charged with removing the, the tray, but they can somehow touch the board. And we thought, okay, maybe that's signaling in some way. And there was a group, and I think that that was what was done in the European Bridge League. I'm not sure because I was never present in their like discussions. They tried to use the the code, but with the east-west hand as well as the north-south, and nobody argued that the east-west and are basically new data, fresh data. And there is one more method that I used, and that's something that used in archaeology. How do you determine if something is historically significant when you find something? I mean, you cannot model anything in advance because you don't know what you're going to find. And then after you found it, how do you say it's significant or not? And we found a paper from 2007 analyzing a case where they found the tomb of Jesus in Israel. They found the tomb of Jesus. They actually say like uh, several important names from the New Testament, like Jesus, Matthias, Mary Magdalene, and they all found it in the same burial tomb. And they tried to, to figure out what are the odds to get so many important names, so many important uh, historical figures in one burial tomb? And they said, OK, that's the grave of Jesus. And basically what they did was to multiply all possible names as were uh, found in other historical uh, information. And then they said, OK, so we don't have fresh data, but we've demonstrated the odds to find something as significant is uh, very low. And if you start multiplying, then uh, we figured out that the results are not that significant in breeds anymore. So they didn't like using that method. Now, the Kit Wolsey, who actually posted the original accusation, have sent me a private message claiming that the true test for hypothesis is the power of prediction. He basically agrees. And then he said, OK, they used just one set of boards. I predicted using the three other sets, except that wasn't what happened. I mean, there was a crowdsourcing call, and all the hands were actually available. They actually reviewed all hands, and then they raised the hypothesis. So you cannot check the hypothesis that you raised using four sets of hands on three sets of hands simply because somebody put just one set of hands on the website. So we disagreed. The European Breed League had a hearing. They argued that, OK, we can use the, the four east-west and the five east-west and from the same tournament where they actually touch the board and use that as fresh data. And I would say, OK, that's fresh data. But then the uh, north-south code included five options, including where you don't touch the tray and the board remains for no preference. And that doesn't work well for east-west, because east-west doesn't touch the board most of the time, and north-south are charged with removing the tray. So they developed a four-way a four signaling, and they just removed the, the no, no preference. And they said, if we don't touch the board, that means nothing. That's like a random noise. But that makes the east-west uh, hands and not fresh anymore, in our opinion, because you only develop that method after you watch the east-west hand. You saw that there is no sign for no preference, and you decided what it means. I mean, you could say that putting the, the, the tray on Svart's side or on Ron's side is no preference or anything like that, and you picked specific meaning. So we said, OK, the east-west hands are not fresh anymore. Then we said, the sample size is too small. All in all, uh, there were only 37 boards where, no, where uh, Fischer and Svart defended. There were only 64 boards in question. They played 27 hands. They were on defense on 37 hands. Out of them, a signal was actually given. And a signal was actually given where there was no weak lead. There was no. Uh, board that remains for no preference, and there was no case where it's signals for diamonds, and in that case, the board actually ends in the proper position. 
the signal was actually given in only 11 times. And out of the which nine were correct. And if we consider uh, uh, the importance of archaeological finding, nine out, of, nine out of 11 is not really sufficient. And fortunately, more boards were available. So we looked at other torments. But first, how was 9 out of 11 calculated? So experts were given a, an advice, a, the boards and said, if you had an illegal signaling method, what would you signal with such a hand? Some uh, experts would pick, let's say, spade. Some would pick signal for heart. Some would say signal for no preference. And then if any of the experts chose the signal actually on the table, that was considered true positive. However, experts are not always having the same opinion. On certain boards, experts can pick three or four different opinions. So the result of what would you signal is basically close to a, to a coin toss and not really to, to one out of five or one out of four cases. And there were just two significant outliers that couldn't be explained. Uh, I had a world-class player uh, tell me, I'm sure that they cheat, but this is not a way that they cheat. It's impossible that they cheat this way. I want them to be caught for real. The first outlier was a dead ball where Svartz was supposedly signaling for clubs. And if you look at Svart's hand, he first he beat spades, he beat three spades, then he has the king queen fourth of hearts, he has a queen jack six times of, of uh, spades. I could find a reason to, to play for a spade signal or to, pay, to play for a heart signal or even to play for no preference signal. But one thing that I'm not going to choose is signaling for clubs holding a uh, no clubs. That's basically impossible. Another outlier, which is less obvious, is that hand where Svartz holds a king jack fourth of clubs, but he actually doubles five clubs. So he says that he has clubs. And once more, no expert would actually uh, choose a, a club signal. And if you look, Fisher actually signals, uh, plays spades. And Fisher is not likely to hold clubs in that auction anyway. So those two are basically two unexplained boards that couldn't be explained or adjusted or anything using the old method. And as I said, are we alone? So the vast majority, let's say 90% of the world, is more or less convinced that Fisher and Zwart are sitting and that the method is actually what was published in Bridge Winners. Uh, there is a minority that rejected the claim, including Mr. Inon Liran, who is world champion, uh, in uh, Mind Games uh, Olympics in 2014, and is like actually giving testimony that that's impossible, that that's the method of cheating that two world class players would use. Uh, they get support from uh, professors from Weizmann Institute of, of Science and CERN. Uh, claiming that the statistic was actually wrong, Mr. Ilam Gross. Both Inon and Ilam have actually gave their testimony in the Israeli Brit Federation and it's available online. We believe, we don't know, that sponsors play, paid for their defense. Uh, Ron claimed that the defense cost one million shekels, which is between one quarter of a million of euros or one quarter of a million of uh, dollars, so something so we think somebody else paid for that defense. And we, we try to look at the stuff and what did we find? First of all, we find that if you switch the spade signal and the club signal and look at the same data, you get eight out of 11 that are correct. So nine out of 11 doesn't sound like too much if you can switch the signals and still get the same results. By the way, the signal only includes three suits, spades, clubs, and hearts. And we switched two of them and got the same result. So it doesn't sound like too much. And 
Then when we try to look at other stuff, which requires some bridge knowledge, but when we look at odd even ends or when we look at high curl points, we can find other signaling methods that are just as good getting the same nine of, out of 11. But then when we look at other ends, we find that the other codes collapse and the code proposed on the internet is usually working okay, but introduces one extra outlier from the Polish Bridge League. So perhaps it's not the correct code after all. But again, we are not sure why the movement of the board is so weird. So we look at the hand some more and we find out that Fischer signals like three or four times more than Svartz. Fischer's signaling whenever he's on defense, Svartz signaling whenever he actually has something to say. And we start with the hypothesis that let's not use near far as uh, P.O. Collins suggested, but let's use near Svartz, near Fischer uh, uh, signaling method, which is basically our innovation. So if you look at Fisher uh, signaling, that remains the same because near is basically near Fisher. But if you look at Svart signaling, then his signaling is actually the opposite of a uh, calling method. And all of a sudden, basically, it all makes sense. We have uh, 11 out of 11. Everything is correct. We don't have any outliers. So we wanted to test them fer it, it further. And we looked at additional balls that they played. We watched at some more hours of basically four fat men playing breeds. We found seven more hands from the Polish Breeds League. We found uh, five more hands from the European Breed Championship where they played East West. We found one more breed hand from the North American Breed Championship. And we found, uh, we found uh, one more hand from the European Open Team Championship in uh, Tromso. And basically, it all makes sense. It all fits. And then we have to figure out what to do. And I'm taking a legal detour. Now, I'm saying once more, I'm not a lawyer. I'm not so sure that everything that I describe here is correct. But Fischer and Zwarz were facing three different trials on three different jurisdictions. The American Control Bridge League, the European Bridge League, and the Israeli Bridge Federation. And we are not sure. I mean, they already have submitted the accusations. Can you change the accusation while the trial still goes on? And if you can't, what does it mean if we publish that the code is wrong? Does double jeopardy apply? I mean, if they are found innocent of using one code, can you accuse them of using the other code? And if they are found not guilty, are they off the hook? And do they need to be proven guilty beyond reasonable doubt? Or is there a more electric criteria? We don't know. But I can tell you what we decided. Uh, we decided to wait until the hearing in the European Bridge League and not publish anything by then. Because we thought that, OK, the code is not like airtight. It's not correct. But we think that it's enough to actually convict them. We don't want to, to mess with the, the legal case that actually happens. Um, we had everything unpublished until the European Bridge League actually delivered the verdict. But we did talk about the results. And it's possible that the judges in the European Bridge League knew that the code is not correct, but they knew that there is a correct code that they cannot modify and they cannot actually use to chart the pair. After the ABL generated a guilty verdict, we actually released our results. And the Israeli Bridge Federation, for sure, and we think the American Contract Bridge League, which held a trial in August, we think that they used our code to accuse the pair. So the aftermath for Fischer and Zwartz, the European Bridge League convicted Fischer and Zwartz of cheating and banned them for playing for five years. And they also issued a massive fine, uh, which we think that Fischer and Zwartz will not pay and they will be banned for life. 
the uh, European Bridge League actually is noted that they are not using proven beyond all reasonable doubt, but only proven to sufficient uh, probability that they are cheating. Perhaps it's because they heard of our code. The American Contract Bridge League expelled Fischer and Zwart for good. They removed them for, to play for life. The Israeli Bread Federation, which we think had the most thorough examination and the longest hearings, have concluded its hearing and is supposed to release a verdict. But after the two previous verdicts were actually published without anything but a guilty verdict will be released. As for the other theaters that we didn't deal with, uh, the Italian Bridge Federation and the European Bridge League convicted Fantoni Nunes. The American uh, Contract Bridge League expelled them for life. The Deutsch Bridge Federation, the German Bridge Federation, and the European Bridge Federation convicted uh, uh, Pierre and Smirnov. And the ABL is still reviewing the Balitsky Muzinski case. We think that they uh, actually. I don't want to give uh, predictions. Uh, Fischer opened a, a pub, Svart Fischer this the green chemistry, and they are hopefully outside of Breed's world for good. We wish them all the best, but don't play Breed's ever again. Uh, what did we achieve? So Fischer and Svart are outside the world of Breed's, hopefully for life. The sponsors deserted the Fischer and Svart. Fischer and Svart reported that they fired their lawyers that's when we heard that it cost one million seconds to actually pay them. Uh, there is no longer a shred of doubt in anybody's mind that they were sitting. All the players that supported them initially deserted. And I still argue about scientific method with some professor from uh, Chicago. Uh, perhaps the argument will never end. Some advice for cheaters. If you do cheat, Try not to be obnoxious. One of the way, the reasons that Fantoni Nunes managed to cheat for about 20 years and Fischer and Svort were caught after one year after cameras were available was because Fischer and Svort were obnoxious and basically raised the entire world against them. And we figured that it seems pretty easy to develop some unbreakable code, for example, generate some pseudo-random string which you cannot break and just move the code, rotate the code based on the pseudo-random string and that's basically unbreakable. And if you are caught sitting and somebody is accusing you of using incorrect code, uh, shut up. One of the things that Fischer Zwart did which was very bad for them was trying to uh, basically Accused Boyev of Slar swinging for $1 million, trying to raise too much noise, and as a result, we got involved and we broke their code. So perhaps if, if only they were shutting up, this would have gone away. And advice for uh, researchers, authorities, vigilantes. So in Breed, there is this, show us the code. We will not convict a pair unless somebody shows the code and prove that they were actually cheating. And that doesn't work. As we said, I mean, we, I can define unbreakable code. I can just generate some uh, random string of numbers, and Breed's players are very good at memorizing numbers. So we think that basically all future codes and all future cheaters will not be detectable by breaking the code. Um, another thing is when trying to break the code, try to look at the code from the recipient perspective, because, for example, one of the things that we found out in one of the cases, East-West helped Fischer and Zwart, and East removed the board from the table and placed it on the table. But that was actually sending a signal to the other end. So don't ignore those things, don't ignore those outliers, try to look at camera angles. We actually sat near a screen and try to figure out how things look from the player's perspective, not only from the camera perspective, and things sometimes look different. So that's actually important. Uh, there is now talk in Breeds to stop using physical cards, start playing on iPads or stuff, and start uh, sending electronic signals because that will remove uh, cheating. Well, I guess I can tell you in this room that 
any electronic means is not going to stop cheating. People will break into the iPhone or iPad. People will find some ways to broadcast information. I mean, that the fact that you are using cards or not using cards is not going to stop or prevent cheating. What would prevent cheating is when somebody does something irregular, then question him, try to figure to receive the logic, and if somebody makes too many questionable moves and is world champion, he's probably cheating. And one more thing, don't expect any praises. I'm still involved in credit wars about it. That's why I was very uh, precise at what we contributed and what others contributed. But people are more happy to to uh, fight over credit than to actually uh, think what you did is good. And the last thing is something very, very unique. We actually uh, had two sitting pairs, uh, the Germans, Smirnov and Pierre playing against Fischer and Svold on the European Bridge Team Championship. And one and a half hours into the match, it appears that uh, Fischer was caught sitting, Pierre uh, Ketzezim tells him that he's moving the board and he's signaling by moving the board and Fischer more or less laughs it off. And then two hours into the match, uh, uh, Fischer tells uh, Pierre Krek, okay, I know you, how you are sitting, you are sitting in a certain way, you are placing the cards in a certain way to tell your partner if you are minimum or maximum for your bids. And he's writing down, like, Pierre makes some bids that says six to 10 points. He writes down, you have 10 to 11 points. And basically catches him online. And of course, neither Smirnov, nor Pierre nor Fischer, nor Svart actually reported each other. They basically signaled, okay, we know, and let's continue and get on with our seating. So that was actually funny. Okay, so... Okay, Fischer actually moves the board because that's how he's cheating and he's actually telling him, I know that you are cheating. Then 30 minutes later, he makes an opening bid of two diamonds, which he places near him, which is six or 10 points. Fischer is actually moving the, the bid. Oh, shit. Fischer is actually moving the bid, so now it's, uh, it's near uh, his partner. Now it's actually so six points instead of 10, and he's writing down on his note that you have, you have shown 10 to 11 points, which is actually readable. And Smirnov does, says like, Okay, and proceed. So, basically, two cheaters catching each other live, breaking each other code during play, and of course, not reporting. And again, credit, so, we use the work of Boya Brugland, Perula Collin, eh, Trim, Tira, and uh, Keith Woolsey. The videos that I presented, especially with the audio and like uh, zest of stuff, is by Michael Clark. And lots of thanks to Inon Liran, Eldad Ginosar, Udi Friedlinder, Gilad Ophir, Nicholas Omond, and Professor Greg Lawler for helping with the stuff and generating more data on the, on the case. Thank you. <laughs>